and All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful program for an update on contemporary Jewish music. I'm Mark Kligman, director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience here at UCLA. And I'm very proud to be the uh, co-organizer of this program with my very dear friend and colleague, Judah Cohen. The impetus for this project is that uh, tw over 20 years ago, I wrote an article called Contemporary Jewish Music, which was published in 2001 in um, the American Jewish Yearbook, which really tried to look at Jewish music from the 1970s until through the late 90s. As we were approached by the Journal of Synagogue Music to create a 20 year update on this article, I knew it was much larger and grew so big, more than I could do. So I elicited the help of Professor Judah Cohen. And we in turn developed a whole team of 18 researchers and uh, we'll provide you a link to where you can actually find uh, this article. Uh, so we're very uh, pleased that you could join us. We, um, for those of you that follow the event link, all of the presenters who, who, or all the authors of the articles have actually created YouTube videos with three to five minute uh, versions of their articles. And also that article is fully available. So we wanna get this information out in different ways. And we're very pleased that we can have some special guests who didn't write in this article join us to really uh, look at and contextualize these issues and we have a wonderful program planned. Without further ado, I wanna turn things over to Professor Judith Cohen and thank Indiana University Jewish Studies Department for being a co-host and putting this program together. Thanks so much, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here, uh, partially because one of the things that I love, uh, especially about talking about music in Jewish life, is that we get to engage with lots of different people, people that have had a lot of experience in it and people who have lots of experience but haven't yet spoken with scholars too much on music. Um, and so we're in this fantastic place right now uh, where I am thrilled that we are able to bring in two phenomenal scholars uh, to be able to engage with not just the article, but also with the videos uh, and to be able to start the next level of the conversation uh, that we've been having on Jewish music in America. I am thrilled uh, to introduce first Professor Laura Yaris. Uh, Professor Yaris uh, from uh, Michigan State University uh, is, a, uh, is a scholar on Jews and Judaism in modernity with particular interest in Jewish education. Uh, her current research includes a book project exploring the growth of Jewish Sunday schools and the development of the category of religion in 19th century American Judaism. She's published articles on material culture of flowers in 19th century Jewish confirmation ceremonies, uh, as well as the integration of developmental psychology into 19th century reform Jewish pedagogy. Um, I also am thrilled to introduce Professor Sharon Avni, who's an applied linguist whose research focuses on language ideology, socialization, policy, and discourse in language education. She combines ethnographic fieldwork, sociolinguistic theory, and discourse analysis, and her research primarily examines the field of Hebrew teaching and learning, use, and ideologies in informal and formal contexts in the United States. Now, this uh, discussion in some ways got started when I heard from both of them and uh, we started talking about a phenomenal ethnographic project in the arts and Judaism in America. Uh, and we had this long conversation about uh, how to think about music in different ways to perhaps go about exploring additional uh, approaches to music and the arts. Uh, it's from this that I realized, wait a minute, what a fantastic uh, dialogue we could have as we move forward. And so it's really a thrill uh, to be able to introduce them and to be a, uh, to uh, bring them into this fantastic discussion. Uh, responding will be uh, Dr. Galit Dardashti, uh, an artist in residence at Indiana University, uh, as well as an accomplished uh, scholar and uh, who has published on all kinds of areas, including uh, music and Mizrahiyut. Uh, Uri Schrader, a PhD candidate at Harvard University, who focuses on the politics of Jewish music during the early pre-war period, as well as other areas. Uh, 
and uh, Professor Rabbi Jeff Summit, a research professor of music at Tufts University and the Emeritus Director of Tufts Hillel. And finally, giving final comments will be Professor Mark Sloven, Professor Emeritus at Wesleyan University. That is all of the introductions. And now let's just get to the material. I am thrilled to introduce Professor Laura Yaris. Thank you so much, Judah, and thank you, Mark, and, and thank you, everybody, for inviting Sharon and I to join you this evening. It, it really is such a, such a treat. Um, as Judah mentioned, he uh, and Sharon and I came into conversation over a project that Sharon and I are working on together, a book-length project, looking at Jewish learning in cultural arts contexts. We're both scholars of, of education. Uh, we're not professional musicians or, or scholars of, of music. And so I, I think it's fair to say that, that both of us would describe ourselves in different ways as, as music adjacent, right? So my training is in, uh, is in religious studies in the fields of, of history and ethnography. Um, and so the way that I have approached uh, looking at, at these at this, uh, this article today and, and thinking um, about my remarks this evening is to really think about what this example of music, what the example of, of contemporary Jewish music in America and its changes over the last 20 years has to teach those of us who are interested in these broader questions of what Judaism and Jewishness, uh, particularly in America, looks like. So in my remarks this evening, I'd like to highlight uh, four dynamics in particular that I see emerging in these papers that I think have a lot to teach those of us, um, no matter how much of a foot we might have uh, in the particularly musical world of American Judaism. So the first thing I'd like to say is that I think that all of these papers have a lot to teach us about what cultural Judaism looks like and indeed what it sounds like. And there has never been a more opportune moment for us to get smarter about the texture of cultural Judaism. So Many of you on this call have probably uh, read about, heard about, or, or read the Pew Report. And the undeniable finding of, of both of the two major Pew surveys of American Judaism, the latest of which uh, was published in 2021, really points uncontroversibly to the fact that, that American Jews aren't necessarily a particularly religious group, but they do have deep investments um, in what we might, in what, uh, what we can call broadly Jewish culture. Now, the Pew findings bring us further along in the project of, of mapping the interests of American Jews, but it doesn't tell us much about the texture of those engagements. So we need to do more work to delve more deeply into the world of, of Jewish culture. What's, what's the nature of Jewish cultural life? How is Jewish culture experienced? And how do people conceptualize Jewish culture in Jewish terms? Now, it strikes me that music offers all of us a really fantastic opportunity uh, to think through those questions and particularly a vehicle for expressing them. Now, we know culture is a very complex term, right? It's a, it's a term that we could spend all of our time this evening thinking about. It's a complex theoretical idea to, to think about what it means to be, uh, to be a part of a culture, to perform culture, um, to have culture. But I think if we've learned one thing over the last two years, it's that, it's that cultures are not homogenous. Cultures are diverse and, and cultures are, are complex. Cultural identities are complex. Um, and Jewish cultural identity is complex too. And we know that, that any Jewish cultural identity is made up of a series of intersections of different kinds of identity, gender, nationality, ethnicity, race, upbringing, socioeconomic location, so many different constellation of factors um, that make an individual so individual. And I often find as a scholar who trades most of the time in language that language provides a very inefficient vehicle for expressing the deep complexity of, of cultural engagement and cultural participation. And when I was reading Galit's paper in particular, I couldn't help but think to myself, oh my goodness, folks who deal in Jewish music have an incredible vehicle for conveying this complexity. 
So whilst those of us who deal in words might sort of trip over hyphenated ideas like being a Persian Jew or a British American Ashkenazi, that's me, by the way, um, language, uh, language is, 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 is very limited. Whereas when we think about music, right, we can think about um, the flexibility of layering Hebrew over Arabic and Ladino over a Moroccan piyut and an Arabic makam and, and an electronic dance beat. Sometimes those tones are going to be cacophonous and, and sometimes they're going, to, um, they're going to be harmonious. But what seems clear is that music really has offers us a wonderful medium to think through and with the idea of multi, multiple cultural belongings and through the intersections of multiple cultural identities. The second dynamic that really intrigued me about all these papers reflecting on the state of contemporary American Jewish music are the ways that they, they all described American Jews as searching for aesthetic entry points into their Jewishness. Now, if you spend time looking at most sociological, most demographic surveys of American Jewish life, it's fair to say that they're most concerned about institutional belonging, right? It's, they're, they're interested in asking what institutions Jews are members of, uh, the ritual practices they perform, uh, what Jews do or don't eat, and of course, most controversially, who they do or don't marry. Now, it strikes me from reading these papers that a much fresher perspective on who American Jews are and how they do their Jewishness might be gained if we begin from the question of asking, what are the spaces and places that make the hairs on the back of their neck stand on end? What are the associations? What are the relationships? What are the sounds? What kinds of performances create aesthetic entry points uh, into Jewish life uh, that, that engage people um, and, and make them want to participate? And this came up particularly for me in thinking about Uri's paper on Jewish music festivals, as I found myself really wondering who's in the audience and what motivates them to be there. Um, like who are the people who are diehards, right? And who drops in for just or set, a set or two? And surely it seems to me that these kinds of events are not just drawing Jews into the audience, but are drawing a much broader audience of non-Jewishly identif identified folks as well. So my suspicion is that we have a lot to learn from studying the audiences of these kinds of musical settings about what Jewish spaces are and who is in them. The third dynamic that I would like to point to, and, and this is a theme that I saw running through many of the papers in this wonderful article, um, is the role of funders in shaping the contemporary American Jewish musical scene. So I was struck by how many of the authors talked about the different fellowships that had enabled their musical journeys, um, and particularly travel, right? how travel had opened up their musical journeys, particularly travel to Israel. And I couldn't help but ruminate on the fact that many of the grant opportunities that were described in these papers are no longer available, such as the, the Six Points Fellowship for Emerging Jewish Artists, for example. Now, it's exciting to see how philanthropic investment has, has really supported the germination of such exciting new directions in American Jewish music. But it's also somewhat sobering to think about the, the waxing and waning of Jewish funders' interests in Jewish music as well. I'm mind, uh, mindful here of the work of uh, historian of American Judaism, Lila Corwin Berman, um, who in her recent book has written about the power that funders and foundations have amassed to shape American Jewish life, including the shaping, uh, shaping the production of American Jewish culture. And as a scholar who, think, who spends a lot of my time thinking particularly about American Jewish ed education, I can also reflect upon the broad range of educational initiatives that receive pretty consistent support from various Jewish funders, precisely because they align with policy directions that have long been acknowledged to be at the heart of a very particular set of American Jewish communal interests in marriage, attachment to Israel, Jewish observance, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering what place in all of this for Jewish music? Of course, there are foundations and organizations that are explicitly committed to the production of, of Jewish culture, but I'm also wondering, and here I'm circling back to my initial observations about the Pew Report, 
what would it take to make financial investment in Jewish music a communal priority on par with birthright or summer camps? But that also leads me to my final consideration. And uh, this is something that, that Judah Cohen mentions in his concluding remarks uh, in this wonderful special edition. It's hard to ignore the fact that some of the, the most exciting uh, and vibrant developments on the American Jewish cultural scene, including the American Jewish cultural scene, might not be happening at the levels of, at the level of institutions um, and at the level of funders and funding, but in fact in more grassroots venues. So increasingly I'm finding that whenever students uh, in my classes at Michigan State University come to me with questions about Jews and Judaism, they're coming to ask me about things that they saw on TikTok. Uh, and particularly uh, the range of Jewish musical production um, that they are seeing on, on TikTok in particular um, is hard to ignore. So it strikes me that when we gather again um, on Zoom or its technological uh, successor in 20 years time to have this discussion, um, it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat inevitable um, that the scene will have been changed entirely by TikTok and other kinds of streaming sites um, that maybe bypass or at least um, have a different kind of relationship um, with Jewish institutions and their funders and their narratives um, and what exciting potential uh, they all have to think anew uh, about what this business of being Jewish might be all about. Thanks so much, Professor Yard. So let me move, let's move now to Professor Sharon Alfie. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm talking to you from New Jersey, and it's a real pleasure to uh, be a part of uh, this group. Thank you to Mark and Judah so much for inviting us, and to Galit, Ori, and Jeff, thank you so much for also being a part of it. So um, if Laura describes her academic work or where she positions herself as music adjacent, I wanna just say, that she's being a little humble because she comes from a family of musicians. And I actually saw her husband is on the Zoom call now, and I understand that he is quite a musician himself. Uh, and so um, I just wanted to put that out there. I think that I would call myself more sound centric. My training is in language education and linguistic anthropology. And um, I, I, I think that those are areas that take sound seriously and really interested in better understanding the social work that um, music does. So Judah had mentioned a little bit of my work and I just want to bring it up a little bit so that it intersects a little bit with what I'll be, uh, the, the points I'll be making. So um, as he mentioned, most of my work focuses on American Jews in all different contexts, what they have to say about Hebrew. So I'm less interested in what they can actually do with the language. I, you know, I don't do proficiency tests or things like that. I'm more focused on really what the language does for them. And so the beliefs that they attach to the language and the commentary, the sort of metalinguistic things that they say about it. Because I believe that those are ways that we can get to uh, some of the values, the priorities, the fears, the concerns of contemporary American Jews. So in my field definitely overemphasizes the visual and the te and text, but it, more and more there is a, um, uh, there's more multi-sensory um, ethnography, and it definitely, there's more of an attention on the sonic dimension of, of what we might call the social experience. And so it's from that angle, what I think of as really is the social life of music that I'm approaching um, uh, my comments this evening, or this afternoon in, in California. So, um, I have to say that in reading all of the chapters, and especially the three uh, uh, of the speakers we have tonight, I was struck by uh, tensions that exist within the papers and between them. And the first one that really jumped out to me has to do with this age old kind of linguistic chestnut that we have about form versus content. So what is actually said uh, in, in contrast to the form in which it's wrapped. 
So I'm not sure how many of you actually know the chapters. I don't, I don't know if they were um, offered to the audience beforehand, but just briefly, Khalid's work describes trends in the performance and discourse surrounding Middle Eastern and Northern African Jewish music in the United States. And its shift toward um, including more marginalized and silent voices. And Uri's work points to the expansion of music festivals um, and the creation of, of Jewish space. I'll talk about Jeff's in a bit, but the, I'm going to leave those two for a second. Um, in both cases, at least to me, there seems to be an unresolved tension um, surrounding the promotion of different styles and genres and Jewish languages, so we could think of that um, as some of its content. Um, and the genres are the, the form that they're in. And I recognize the affective and emotional and aesthetic power of music to do all sorts of things. But I'm just, I was questioning, is there still any value in understanding what is being said? And specifically, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about what I think is extraordinary work by Jeffrey Chandler and his concept of post vernacularity. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, this term or, or his book, he uh, he does beautiful work showing that the very fact that something is said or written or sung in Yiddish is as meaningful as the meaning of the words being said, if not more so. So in other words, the social um, reality of using uh, Yiddish and the performative nature of using the language actually trumps the communicative or referential value of the words being said. So in some senses, we can think of, of his, his um, idea as form is more powerful in some way than the actual content. Um, and so when I think about Jeffrey's, uh, Jeff's work in, in, um, in, when I read these articles, I thought, you know, our music festivals, our Jewish music festivals, and our, is the expansion of um, Middle Eastern and North African uh, music, is it a form of post-vernacular Jewish culture? Um, how do we avoid, if so, how do we avoid, or how do we think about the tokenization that might be happening as a result? And if it's not, if it's something else, um, um, in what ways is it different? Um, and specifically, when I ask that question, I'm thinking, what does that mean for the artist? But also, what does it mean for the listening subject, the person, the people, the individuals who are listening to uh, this music? So that's the first tension that I, uh, that I, that I found reading these chapters. The second um, um, tension is this, is the is the idea around what is the authentic and what is local. Um, so I was struck by the fluidity of boundaries that both Galit and Ori's chapters address. So Ori's chapters talking about how music festivals are expanding throughout the United States and how music is being brought to people through these festivals and doing all sorts of important kinds of um, identity and social work, cultural work. And Galit's work shows the breakdown of boundaries as more performers are being brought in or, or actively making their way in to these spaces that were once um, not open to them. In both, in both cases, it seems to me, stakeholders need to grapple with where Jewish culture resides and who determines its boundaries. And those are really questions of authenticity as I see it. Um, so in other words, these two chapters specifically raise questions for me about what is authentic, where is the local, and who ultimately decides. I mean, at a time when I think the American Jewish community is undergoing dramatic change. And as I wrote this in my own notes, I thought to myself, when is it not? I feel like for as long as I have been studying and just my own life, <laughs> I should, you know, uh, there always seems to be dramatic change going on. But what does the study of Jewish music festivals um, 
more performers from different genres, uh, different ex backgrounds, different experiences, and Torah chanting, which I'll talk about in a second in Jeff's chapter. What does it tell us about the desire for, the yearning, the need for, and at the same time, the rejection of authenticity? Is it still needed? Are we still craving it? We despise it. We despise talking about it, at least in academia. And yet we seem like moths to the light um, driven to it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm equally struck by the inherent paradox that I saw in all three chapters. Um, and uh, Jeff's chapter specifically talks about um, the uh, Torah chanting at uh, B'nai Mitzvah services, ceremonies. And I thought to myself, as the Jewish community is redefining boundaries and expanding to include new voices, languages, genres, styles, histories, identities, and spaces, why is it simultaneously holding on so tightly to prescriptive ways of chanting Torah, which is what uh, Jeff's chapter is about. Why, you know, uh, to me, th this question just kept emerging um, as I was reading and thinking about these chapters. Why do some forms of Jewish music seem more open for reinterpretation than others? Uh, why do some types of public Jewish sounds or performances, why are they afforded more flexibility? And I just, you know, I, I'm interested to hear in what um, the authors have to say about that, might have to say about that. And Jeff, your chapter personally hit a note uh, in my life because I am the parent of two uh, children who over the past, I guess, three years or so, both have become uh, bat mitzvahs. And so we went through the um, the experience of them learning to uh, chant Torah. And I learned it myself because I never uh, learned as a child. And so I took it upon myself, at least for my older child. The second one, we could talk about another time, but at least for the first one, I also learned uh, to chant Torah. And I, I, I think the the technology surrounding this, all the different uh, things online about how to to learn this, really, in, at least in my in my way, uh, it was by rote. My daughters had these very sophisticated, color coded, uh, um, um, what would, what do you call them in English? Um, hey, what's it called? Um, I can't remember what they're called in English, a classer, uh, like a notebook of some type. And it was really quite, you know, a, quite a sophisticated task um, to, to, to learn this. But um, what I found as a, as, a, as a parent of children and someone who sat in a, lo uh, in a lot of services watching other children uh, become uh, bar or bat mitzvahs, is that there was a lot of talk not only about um, learning the, the Torah chanting, but about how much should or could be done. Um, my child is doing this. Oh, well, my child is doing this. And I couldn't help but think to myself, wow, this is, these are discourses of, of what a sociolinguist calls enoughness, discourses of enoughness. What is enough? And why are we focused on it? Why is this measure of how much someone should be doing of something? Why does that take on awful moral panics or concern? What is this? What does it reveal about us? And I think in this regard, I think it, it has something to do with moral judgments about um, about uh, Jewish education and about our our sense of, of, of what is enough and what is appropriate. So I thought if the other chapters in this volume are talking about a shift away from hierarchical life, Jewish life, this chapter seems to reaffirm a hierarchy of skills and particular forms of mastery, which I just found really um, fascinating. And I, I hope that Jeff will uh, have the opportunity to, to speak to that. So with that, I'm going to end. Um, I thank you uh, again for inviting me, and I look forward to hearing uh, what everyone has to say. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Avni. We have two fantastic sets of comments, uh, and I'm just going to go straight into it, and I'll just uh, ask uh, now for each of the respondents, uh, Dr. Galit Dardashti, uh, Uri Schrader, and uh, Professor Jeff Summit, to please uh, go one right after the next. You don't need me to go in between you all uh, and take your, uh, let's go ahead and hear what you have to say. Okay, um, first of all, um, I'm so delighted to be here with, with my esteemed colleagues. Um, I was so excited to participate in this um, publication. I'm gonna keep my comments brief so we can have um, more conversations. So, um, so many great questions and I will not have time to answer all of them, but I'll just take a few. So first of all, Sarah, um, you know, are Jewish music festivals and Jewish and uh, Middle Eastern MENA, uh, Jewish music, a form of post vernacular Jewish culture? So I I'm very interested in that question because it's something that I've thought of. So performances of um, Middle Eastern and North African Jewish music, which I'm referring to as MENA Jewish music um, in the US absolutely can function as a form of post vernacular Jewish culture in the ways that Jeffrey Chandler defines it, the social and the performative are absolutely more important than the words that the performers are actually singing. But there are a few great distinctions that I have actually been thinking about in some of my other work that are at play um, in this example in the US as well. And the first is that, uh, the, the main point is that I don't believe that the concept of post vernacular captures the more political nature of these uh, MENA Jewish musical practices. And I think that in general, the concept of post um, vernacular is doesn't capture uh, politics as much. Um, and and uh, those performing MENA Jewish music are are seeking to be political. And the most obvious way is that the sound of this music marks it as political. So you know, while perf performing in Arabic, Persian, or Turkish languages can be relevant, this is most often sacred music performed in Hebrew, right, um, here in the U.S. But the sounds uh, of these music practices um, are really what mark them rather than the language. And those that perform these musical uh, traditions in the mainstream are often deliberately inserting these sounds there where they hadn't been before. And then the second way that this music is overtly political is that those that perform it are also deliberately attempting to demonstrate the shared nature of these music traditions with non-Jews in the MENA world. Um, in terms of tokenization, I, I don't, it's such a big topic, but in terms of the young people studying and immersing themselves in these musical tradition, I, I don't see tokenization, quite the contrary. I'm quite optimistic as I see attempts to find teachers who can teach, um, teach them how to really thoroughly sing Moroccan Jewish music um, and to study the maqams. And many young people are studying Arabic, Judeo-Persian, so they can more fully connect with what they see as their heritages. Just a little bit about audience, there's less of a distinction between audience and performer because more audience members now identify as Sephardi Mizrahi. And that really wasn't the case when I, for instance, started performing this music 20 years ago. There were just, I was really performing predominantly for Jews that identified as Ashkenazi. So both Sarah and Laura, and particularly Laura, noticed the relationship between Jewish music and institutional power and money. And this is a subject of critical importance in my own work, particularly in Israel. And uh, Laura stated something like, perhaps what is most exciting about contemporary American Jewish music is what is happening, not at the inst institutional level, but at the grassroots. And yes, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But artists have to make a living, and unless they are eventually supported at the institutional level, they often won't survive at the grassroots level. And perhaps this will change with TikTok, as um, Laura so provocatively um, suggested. Very, very interesting um, to think about that maybe we can bypass uh, funders in the future. Okay, now just to bring Uri, Jeffrey, and my papers together, I and many of the other musicians I discussed in my paper performed at the Sephardic Music Festival that Uri references multiple times. 
But that festival had very little institutional support, unlike many of the klezmer or Yiddish festivals, so it ultimately fizzled. And I was very lucky to be one of the only musicians performing Mina Jewish music who did receive some support. And honestly, that made all of the, the difference in terms of whether I had the means to continue making music. I am, however, seeing some encouraging signs that there will be much more support for others in the future. And finally, um, Jeffrey says in his article, Torah chanting, quote, feels truer, more authentic, and more historically grounded than many other religious or cultural expressions of Jewish identity, an intimate and personal connection to history, peoplehood, family, and community. And really to bolster your argument, um, Jeffrey, here, and also to, to echo a bit of what Sarah said, you know, the first thing I did in 2004, once I had studied Persian classical music was to ask my father to teach me to chant Torah in the Persian tradition, as that seemed really essential to me. And soon thereafter, I began integrating that chanting into my music. And my son just had his um, bar mitzvah last year, and it was important to me that he chant in with Persian trope. So less, Sarah, about how many portions in that case, more about really encouraging him um, to connect with his Persian identity. So I'm going to end there and uh, hope we'll have more time to, to discuss. Thank you so much. Galit, I just wanted to say you flattered me. You didn't realize it, but you, you've been calling me Sarah, and I think you are thinking of Sarah Benor, who is a partner of mine and I've worked a lot with, and I'm flattered. Any time that I'm compared to Sarah is a good day. So thank you. <laughs> so sorry about that. Completely fine. I really am flattered. OK, I'm, I'm going to jump right in, as Judah asked. Um, Thank you both, Laura and Sharon, for these thought-provoking responses. And uh, thanks to the organizers of this project for inviting me here today. I'll start by addressing Laura's response. Um, Laura, you asked about the audience at music festivals. And quite honestly, I think this is a great prompt for further research into festivals, which I have not yet done. But I'd like to reflect on this question for just a moment. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to study this because of the questions that it raises that intersect with other aspects of contemporary American Jewish life. For instance, I'm curious about the crossover between uh, religious and secular Jewish festivals, both of these terms, of course, in scare quotes. Some, some events, some festivals are targeted, at least in part, at an orthodox audience, which could mean kosher food, no performance on Saturdays, and sometimes even no participation of female performers. And for certain Orthodox concert goers who are very strict about these things, they would probably only go to the festivals that ensure these conditions and wouldn't often cross into the secular Jewish festivals. They might sometimes, but not so often. And it would be interesting, I think, to study to see if this is true, but also if and when the opposite is true, if attendance of festivals that brand themselves as religious or observant, uh, which I, I discussed some of these in my article, if, if these festivals are strictly attended by Orthodox Jews or also by people from other denominations and other faiths that also attend them. And I, I suspect this to be true, but I, I would be curious to learn when and how. Um, I also find it interesting that some festivals develop tightly knit communities around them. You know, these relatively small groups of people who come back every year, every year, the diehards as you call them, whereas other festivals have a less consistent audience, maybe a broader audience in some cases. And I don't know the answers, but I would be curious to learn how and when this happens. I'm guessing that focusing on relatively smaller niche subcultures is one strong determining factor, as in certain Yiddish festivals. But I'm wondering if there are other regional or sectorial factors that also come into play. Um, now, switching over to uh, Sharon's comments, Sharon asked if Jewish music festivals are a form of post vernacular Jewish culture. And like Galit, I, I also latch onto this idea. It's something that I think about a lot. Um, I, I really like Jeffrey Chandler's work. I, I like to think of it as a, a springboard for some of my own work. And I want to jump on this opportunity to First of all, just to lay it out there, Chandler himself cites Yiddish music festivals as an example of post-vernacular Yiddish too, when he discusses the performative aspect of Yiddish. And he says about these festivals, um, I completely agree. Oh, it's telling me that my internet connection is unstable. I hope that you can mostly hear me. Someone can let me know. I don't know. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go on. 
Um, so he says, and I agree that festivals like Klis Canada or Ashkenaz create a kind of virtual Yiddish land, but one in which fluency of Yiddish is generally not assumed. And all of the performances take place with the assumption of no fluency on the part of the attendees. This is mostly accurate, but putting this aside for a moment, uh, it's an opportunity to think about post vernacularity, at least as a metaphor beyond language and think about how it might apply to music and music festivals more broadly. Now, obviously it would work in quite the same way since fluency in music and in language are not fully analogous, but there's still a wide range of engagement with music or musical style and repertoire that we can think about through this lens of fluency. And for that reason, we can talk about the distinction between vernacular and post vernacular modes of musical performance, not just language. So to take a couple of examples from music festivals, uh, a vernacular mode of musical performance could be, for instance, to participate in a klezmer jam session as an instrumental musician who knows the repertoire, knows how to adapt their style of playing to the song that's currently being played, and might even know something about the original social function of the song or its geographical origin. And I compare that, say, with a musical performance of so-called world music. This is different genres and ethnic cultures and includes maybe one number described as vaguely Jewish, featuring, let's say, Eastern European modes and maybe a clarinet with some stereotypical ornamentation. It could be other things as well. And in the latter case, the very fact that we hear something that sounds vaguely Jewish is more important than the actual content of the music itself. Obviously, I'm referencing the Chandler's definition of, of post vernacular here. Now, with this distinction in mind, I want to return to the festivals themselves. On the one hand, Jewish music festivals are post vernacular because they do not assume fluency in music. They want to attract the widest audience possible and not just the experts who are already fluent. And in fact, Mark Slobin, who thankfully is here with us today, he once said uh, in his book, Fiddler on the Move, that Klezmer provides a handy point of connection with Jewishness precisely because it doesn't require complicated knowledge like a language or a sacred text. And you can simply listen and dance as you are. And that's truly, I mean, that is the audience that Jewish music festivals are hoping to attract with Klezmer as with any other idiom. But on the other hand, I would argue that Jewish music festivals, or at least some of them, are trying to sustain Jewish music as a vernacular. They offer a space where people can be exposed to this language and they can delve deeper into it and learn to appreciate and understand the finer meanings of this language. And this is precisely what I mentioned in my article as the rationale that led to the foundation of festivals slash workshops like Kles Camp and Kles Canada, where the founders stated that they were trying to create a space for Yiddish culture to thrive and grow within a community space. And the festivals don't always succeed at this. And, and this is where they sometimes fall into the trap of tokenization that you mentioned, when the attempt to feature certain cultural representations in the absence of fluency or the absence of people who are fluent enough to produce or appreciate these representations could end up with a kind of a tokenized performance. But festivals can also try to avoid that trap, for instance, by offering diversity of content or by encouraging participation of the audience on many different levels, as opposed to mere spectatorship. Anyway, thank you to both of you for bringing these issues into the discussion. I think they're very important for thinking about the performance of Jewish music and especially what's considered Jewish heritage music, which is often the case at music festivals. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I'll... Um... I'll jump right in uh, with my comments too. First, uh, really, thank you so much, Laura and Sharon, and and uh, Orian Galit. It's great to be on this panel with you, and and obviously Mark uh, as well. And uh, Jude and Mark, you keep uh, organizing very very important events, and it's appreciated. Um, so Sharon, I want to jump in and say how you express. Um, how you're much less interested in what contemporary Jews actually know about the Hebrew language or what they do with their linguistic uh, proficiency or competency and more focused on um, what the language ideologies and metalinguistic commentary about the language reveals about the values and priorities and concerns of contemporary uh, American Jews. As you say, the neglected sonic dimensions of social experience. Um, when I read your remarks, I thought, oh my God, this uh, was exactly what I found with Torah reading. Um, and in the larger work that I drew this uh, article from, Singing God's Words, in more than 400 interviews, focusing mainly on lay Torah readers in the Ashkenazi tradition, I was fascinated 
by the symbolic coded meaning of the performance of biblical chant for these contemporary Jews cross-denominationally. Um, this is one way, Laura, as you expressed, to get to the texture of contemporary Jewish experience. Um, when I started asking about contemporary Jews' experience chanting Torah, I was overwhelmed by people's responses. Um, sometimes you know you're on a hot topic when you're at a cocktail party. I don't know if you remember cocktail parties. Um, and, uh, and I began uh, to mention the topic of the book, and I lost track of the times that I had to pull out my iPhone to record people's emotional responses, what it meant to chant at their daughter's bat mitzvah, the convert who finally felt Jewish after he read Torah, or the person who developed a new app so he could study laying on his smartphone. Galit, I love your story. Um, if I had interviewed you, I would have put that in, in the article in the in the book about um, learning your uh, family's time uh, hamikra. Uh, stories piled on stories. The woman who read Torah for the first time to celebrate her 85th birthday. Um, the owner of a major sports team who will go on named but whose initials are Robert Kraft, who cherishes the opportunity to chant the Haftarah at his synagogue on Yom Kippur. Um, women many times started to cry, describing what it meant to read Torah for the first time um, after being denied this experience uh, if they were part of grew up as part of more traditional congregations and then were part of uh, more liberal congregations or orthodox um, women in liberal orthodox congregations. Um, something transformative happened when they stood in front of the scroll of the, the Torah. For many Jews, this, as you said, sonic dimension of social experience was very much about the search for meaningful experiences in religious life. Um, as an ethnomusicologist, I'm interested in how men and women express core values by their musical choices uh, that they make in their lives. And if something else wasn't going on here uh, besides the content, why would lay readers who are so busy, doctors and lawyers and professors and business people and college students, spend hours reading, uh, preparing a reading about the arcane laws of animal sacrifice or the lists of genealogies. Um, you know, Exodus and Genesis are full of great stories, Leviticus less so. Um, so something else is happening here. Um, the Jews I interviewed uh, described Torah reading as stepping into a stream of Jewish history, accessing a place in religious and cultural performance that felt more authentic and historically grounded than many other things they did uh, in their lives. Now, it didn't matter if they understood the text to be revealed from God to Moses on Mount Sinai, or is a collection of Jewish wisdom and law redacted by generations of teachers. The readers became the voice that proclaimed the story of the Jewish people, to, that sang the tradition's core narrative. Um, in my previous, um, in previous studies, when scholars asked why do Jews chant Torah, um, people tended to answer from a historical perspective or functional perspective and address the cadences of the trope uh, as punctuation or how melody um, uh, pointed to specific rabbinic interpretations of the text um, or how chant aids in the memorization of, uh, of scripture. But when I asked Jews why they chant Torah, um, they answered very differently. And within minutes, these women and men were speaking about core issues in their Jewish lives, stepping into the flow of Jewish history, a vertical connection back through time that linked them to something ancient and true. Others spoke about how the performance of sacred text allowed them to experience peoplehood, a horizontal connection to Jews around the world who were chanting the same Parsha at the same time. Um, uh, many, um, uh, for many, the nature of the experience was intellectual as they spoke about understanding and owning the Torah and by extension their Judaism in a deeper way after embodying the text and memorizing it. 
Um, for many Jews, chanting Torah uh, is their personal connection to worship. And I talked to many people who said they really were not that connected to the prayers, but they came to um, uh, services because they were drawn by the, uh, the prayer service and what surrounded it. Um, there's a lot more to be said. I'll just make two other quick points. Um, uh, Sharon, your um, observation on authenticity and on uh, flexibility. Um, what I found was that um, the, the, well, let me specifically address your point of enoughness. Um, I found that enoughness was very much located uh, in the local. Um, and uh, often the depth of the experience was more profound for a person who learned to read Torah for the first time and chanted four or five or six psukim than for a um, Orthodox Balkore who um, was very familiar with the text and could lay in the whole Parsha. Um, for um, Barbat Mitzvah, um, I, I would hope what I found was that in, in um, many places it was the synagogue's expectation, the community's expectation that helped define issues of enoughness, but Judaism is local, and this was done uh, uh, very much from place to place. Uh, finally, the last thing I'd say is that, Laura, um, your reference to Judah's important reflection on how this will be 20 years uh, um, uh, from this time and uh, entirely changed by TikTok and other streaming sites, I just have to say that I didn't meet when I was uh, the rabbi at Tufts I didn't have one student who didn't go online to prepare Torah reading. New apps, programs, YouTube videos, all were replacing local teachers as uh, technology was changing hierarchical authority to a much more horizontal playing field, even though the um, act of Torah reading is clearly rooted in this esoteric knowledge, which is part of what makes it very uh, powerful. So there's a lot more to be said, but I'll just stop there for now. Thank you all. Let's turn it over to Mark Slobin for a final comment, and then we'll transition to questions in the time we have left. Hey, Mark, you're muted right now. Always uh, hard to remember to unmute. Uh, I, I'm just delighted to be here, and I, I was delighted with Laura and Sharon's uh, remarks uh, coming as they do from outside our kind of uh, charm circle of music people talking to ourselves, as we often do, uh, and the fact that they recognize the, the power and the importance of, uh, of music and acknowledging that um, uh, meant a lot to me. I mean, just personally, I remember when I was doing the history of the American Cantorate, uh, and I turned to Marshall Sclair's great study of the American Jewish community, the word cantor was not even in the index. Uh, and, you know, I, I couldn't believe that there was such an obstacle to, to this sort of recognition, which is now finally uh, in the 21st century uh, uh, beginning to happen. Um, so um, I'm going to make a few remarks, uh, some of which occurred to me as people were talking, so it's a little bit on the fly. Um, I want to make a couple of main issues. Uh, what Sharon sees as a flexible uh, improvisatory practice uh, is actually, has actually always been like that. It's in the nature of American culture. Uh, America is a land that lives with um, a very active tension between the individual's needs and strategies um, the formation of often short-lived associative groups uh, and the um, uh, top-down but always negotiable power of communities within the general framework of society. Um, and um, the general society itself is marked by waves of immigration, um, intermittent crises, and, and dueling ideologies. So th this is this is uh, very unlike European societies, and, and and as a result, Jewish music is very different than it has been traditionally in in uh, in in, uh, in European societies. Our music project um, is talking about the current swerves and off ramps of a musical vehicle that has uh, rolled across a, a vast and shifting landscape while always remaining uh, firmly on the grounds while turning its wheels um, due to the constant need for expressive and performative ways of being Jewish, which is really the heart of this. Um, and so this question of authenticity uh, led me to think about uh, what the deeper issue is behind that. 
Um, what Jews, uh, what, what people are doing in heritage systems, uh, Jewish and otherwise, is choosing continuities. So um, the question is among the possible, there's a desire for continuity or we wouldn't be talking about anything like heritage or identity. Um, for most traditional music situations, even in the United States, there's not that many continuities to choose from, say in Irish music or Hungarian music. Uh, traditions, but for the Jews, the number of continuities you could you could decide were important to you uh, is vast, ranging from what Jeff has talked about the continuity of sacred text uh, through the continuity of of, of of what my grandmother's generation knew, uh, you know, and, and many other such continuities. So we're talking about a um, set of choices about uh, continuities that is really. Uh, what is going on here. Now, let me sketch out some of these uh, basic trends again and so I can reinforce them. Um, in, in terms of um, the idea of post-vernacular, um, I, I agree that that term really was useful, but that in by 2022, we're seeing new kinds of vernacularization, say, um, within the uh, Jewish, uh, within the Yiddish world, uh, we had post-vernacular, and now there's a new vernacularization among very young people who are learning Yiddish as a vernacular and trying very hard, musicians, to actually make it their own way of talking musically. Um, that's, that's beyond post-vernacular. So um, this is uh, due to what people have pointed, the decline of older forms of communal organizations that served as cultural engines in, in earlier decades from the Landsmannschaften, which were hometown-based, and that's not relevant to people now, European hometowns, um, citywide newspapers and federations within towns, local chapters of national, international, political, and ideological organizations like the Bund or you know, certain older Zionist uh, organizations. Um, all of that um, tended to ebb for all kinds of reasons we, we, we probably know about, um, but as a result, the, the the Jewish um, mainstream um, really show very little interest in, in culture as something to invest in. Uh, you know, people talk about the edifice complex and, you know, uh, and, and the idea of actually creating brick and mortar things with your name on it. Um, and uh, culture doesn't do that for people, uh, you know, I mean, just to make a cartoon version, the caricature version of this, or the decline and disappearance of the National Foundation for Jewish culture which actually did an awful lot of patronage. Um, it, for some reason, there was no more money for that. Um, so uh, patronage shifted to um, these uh, more malleable and basically consumerist genres, as, as Uri Schreiter points out, that uh, Jewish festivals are a number in the dozens now. That, although they may be participatory, they are often you know, mostly kind of consumerist. Um, and, and when you think that, uh, I read somewhere that the most attended of such events are film festivals. Um, that that is um, that pushes music extremely to the margins, only in terms of film scores and things that happen within uh, with, within say uh, movies, uh, and and it brings Judaism into the area you know of screen time. It's another kind of screen time uh, that you that you add to the one you have already. Um, so um, the tension between those kinds of consumerism and the idea of live um, is really very interesting. So uh, let me just turn just briefly to the grassroots issue. Uh, as Galit says, the, the goal is um, less about transforming the American Jewish musical mainstream, and more about empowering these Middle East, North African Jews on the margins, women, queer, and transgender Jews to form new spaces. Um, the Klezmer world also thrives by uh, new subgroups with their own particular ideologies and interests. Uh, and this is part of an American dialectic process where culture is shaped jointly by the way that individuals, small collectives, and larger affinity groups uh, push up from below against the overarching uh, superculture, my term for that kind of stagnant power base, uh, but which, however, is, is re responsive to pressures from below and will create new opportunities um, if, if there's uh, enough interest and enough pressures. Um, so, um, this kind of freewheeling approach, uh, which certainly the internet has encouraged, um, uh, allows for possible novel alliances. Uh, nobody seemed, I, unless I missed it, talk about the uh, OTD movement or the Off the Derech, where uh, secular and religious um, uh, people get together to share musics, which was something that simply did not happen uh, at an earlier period. Um, 
so the individual has a uh, more of a scope for action. Uh, as Oster Klein says, individuals are empowered to do activities that required a power greater than themselves, starting business, influencing people, producing and sharing content. But um, some of those things are collective, like the COVID era uh, internet schemes um, and projects of, that were really quite substantial and created new forms of collective research and collective music making in the, in the Yiddish world. Um, so um, I'm, I'm kind of delighted in a way overall that this anthology article uh, is upbeat in ways that might have seemed surprising a few years back. Uh, American Jews have taken music to heart in troubled and changeable times in ways that do continue long-term habits but respond to new challenges and opportunities. And I do hope that more social scientists, historians, linguists, anthropologists, psychologists will finally sit up and take notice of the sounds that surround their offices and filter into their classrooms. Uh, and uh, just um, thinking of Mark and Judah who have spent you know, like years trying to uh, get Association for Jewish Studies and other such places more interested in this way of thinking. Uh, and I hope that they find new strategies for uh, reaching wider uh, interdisciplinary audiences with what I think is an emerging consensus that we see uh, about the state of affairs today in this uh, really fine uh, piece of work. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark, and thank you to all respondents. And I also want to make sure to acknowledge uh, that we have other uh, authors of articles from this uh, mega article, uh, Danielle, Daniela Smolov-Levy, uh, Jeff Janesko, uh, Gordon Dale, Samantha Cooper, and Rachel Edelstein, uh, who are also present. Uh, we are now at 9.02, which uh, apparently is uh, after our official time. Uh, but I do want to offer the opportunity for one or two questions to add to this extraordinarily rich dialogue uh, before we uh, head on off. You can do this either by raising your uh, iconic hand uh, or by uh, typing directly into the, the chat. Um, or you could just speak up, uh, which I think is possible too. Okay, so, well, with that, I'm not seeing anybody or any responding yet. Uh, Maybe but some of the other authors that you mentioned uh, can address some of the issues in their articles. I don't know if Gordon, or Jeff, or Rachel, maybe one or two want to feel that they want to respond. Or would like to respond. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Um, it's just getting the space where I could actually, it could, <clears throat> I just it needed to get into a space where I could um, actually speak for a moment. Um, maybe you could just respond on one of the, the tensions I'm picking up on is um, relationship between, you know, the grassroots institutional level. Um, Jeff, you've paused. Maybe I should type it in? Uh, yeah, that would be great if you could. OK. So, uh, but you can start with the tension between the grassroots and then the second part, uh, to feel free to type in. Okay, yeah. 
uh, to what degree you're all looking at what's not being supported by the larger institutional framework and what does that look like as well. Um, this looks like it would be a great kind of way to summarize or to come up with a few final comments. So uh, anybody that wishes, uh, please uh, feel free. Go ahead, Uri. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, um, you know, for my article, I was looking at a very wide range of festivals and I have this giant um, spreadsheet with festivals from the last 80 years or so. And some of them, even though they are festivals, so obviously they are supported by some sort of institution, they're very far from the larger institutional frameworks. Uh, some of them could be very local, uh, both in, in the attendance and in scope, you know, supported by a local synagogue or something, but still carrying the title of festival and enduring for many years. And um, I was thinking about that also uh, with, uh, with the comment, sorry, I forget if this was Laura or Sharon who was talking about the funding and the waxing and waning of the funding, how some of, these, uh, some of these projects can endure for so many years, sometimes like 40, 50 years, despite these, despite these, um, the, the lack of this big institutional backing and these changes. And lastly, I'll just say that um, when I was thinking again um, by, by the prompt about this issue, um, you know, what are other ways that we could imagine um, support for these projects? I was thinking to what is probably the, the first longstanding festival of Jewish music in North America, which was called the Jewish Music Festival, which ran from the mid forties until the late seventies and then without the title festival in some ways into, into the late 20th century, which was not really a festival, but was really more of a recommended program for performance of Jewish music that was dispersed around North America with these posters. And every community would take these things and reach out to musicians, sometimes commission new music. I've seen correspondences with composers all over the world where they're being commissioned to write new music for a festival in, um, I think it was Detroit or something. There was a request from an Israeli composer in the 50s, just as an example. And that is something that is, I wouldn't call it grassroots, and it's definitely still entangled with the institutional framework, but it's much more dispersed. It's much more rhizomatic in a way, if you will. And it's, I don't know if it's a useful thing in our world today, or if maybe perhaps through social networks, we are living that all the time in some ways, but it's just an interesting alternative to these larger projects that need to have um, usually a big name of a donor, otherwise they will never come to fruition. If I could just, uh, yeah, I think those, looking at those earlier periods it is very instructive um, to show how much more mixing and, and, and different varieties of uh, activity there were uh, in, in say the 1940s and 50s. When I did my research, my book on Detroit and the chapter on the Jewish music uh, of Detroit, um, in, in, the, in say the 1940s, um, you could, it looked like we're looking at a Bundist event, we're looking at a Trotskyite event, we're looking at a Zionist event, we're looking, you know, but then when you look at, the, at what was on the programs, there was all kinds of stuff crossing back and forth. You know, there might have been, uh, you know, a swing event or, or 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 some kind of classical music thing going on. And you know, despite the apparent labeling of of the actual uh, patronage that, that was was there. So I, I think this um, this volatility has always been there in in the American Jewish uh, system from the uh, very beginning uh, of the uh, you know from the from the large immigration period the 1880s, uh, extremely eclectic. Uh, and for them, it wasn't so much about choosing continuities so much as was about bringing in an audience, you know, to, to events. And what, what were people going to want to do? Were they going to want to dance, you know, uh, the jitterbug? I mean, or uh, were they going to hear a didactic oratorio? Uh, you know, it, it was, um, you would show the flag for some of those things, but then clearly part of that was, was grassroots even, even then, uh, even though things looked, I think, more institutional. Um, what, what Uri's talking about, that festival, that would be my example of, of a supercultural move. That is, somebody pre presents an, an umbrella, you know, a superculture is an umbrella saying, here is your choices, now all of you nationally under this umbrella can go out and do what you want to do locally. Um, so th that is sort of the opposite of kind of grassroots, um, uh, subcultural, uh, from my point of view. 
If I might add very briefly, um, we didn't have time to engage with, with all of the papers in this wonderful volume, but there was one, I think, that really spoke to this question, Jeff, that, that you raised, and it was the, the, the article on Orthodox uh, Jewish music by uh, Gordon Dale, who I, I saw was here in the audience, and Jeremiah Lockwood, um, and Asya Weissman as well. And some of the things that I recall being very struck by in that, that article were, were, was precisely this question of, of talking about the fact that um, the, so, so many of the vibrant spaces in, in Orthodox Jewish music um, you wouldn't necessarily know about. And I, I think Asya Weissman particularly makes the point of, of Orthodox women's music, right? And this being something that is actually a very vibrant cultural scene, right? But you have to look in the right places. You have to look at how music is being used and particularly musical theater in <clears throat> Orthodox high schools and, and girls, uh, Orthodox camp settings, for example, um, to, to realize that, that, that actually there is a very, very vibrant musical scene within, within Orthodox um, uh, women's life, but, but by only looking at, at synagogues, right? By only looking at what happens around the Shabbat table, you could very easily be left with the impression um, that Orthodox women don't have connections to, to music. And the answer there is, well, that just, you're just looking at the wrong spaces. Um, and so, so Jeff, to your point of if you, when we only look at institutions, we, we miss a lot of, of what cultural Judaism looks like. Yes, I agree. And I think we can also layer on this added dimensions that even within sort of grassroots spaces, domestic spaces, we, we have to be looking in the, in the right places as well. And I think all of this points to uh, how fruitful an, an ethnographic approach to um, not only musical um, performance, but also musical consumption, uh, how much that, that can add to our understanding of the, uh, of the ways that, that music functions uh, within uh, American Judaism. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, <clears throat> the, all of the young artists performing Middle Eastern and North African Jewish music um, that I talked about in the last part of my piece. I mean, none of them are, no, none of them ha had institutional support, but I will say that most of them are looking for it now. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's kind of what I mean about, yeah, these, you know, these grassroots developments, they're, they're starting um, because of all sorts of interests, because some of them are queer and some of them are women who don't have an outlet in their own um, Sephardi Mizrahi communities to pursue um, uh, uh, um, Jewish music in their communities. And so they're looking for these other spaces of, of expressing their identity. And I'll just leave it there. Uh, I would also like to add that um, technology is so challenging the primacy of institutions now. And, you know, it used to be that to learn how to do sacred music, you needed to be part of a uh, local community you know now people could become technicians of the sacred um in the privacy of their kitchens you know and and learn traditions whether it's chazanud or or um how to how to chant torah um and we haven't mentioned but the issue of how um technology during the pandemic um sort of blew apart local um uh connection to institutions and so many people were um shul surfing you know like around the country you know and uh and some with profound impact you know of joining uh communities you um uh on the other uh, side of the country um but we're gonna really there needs to be a lot of unpacking to see um the way the technology is really shifting this landscape now and certainly the on-demand component <laughs> that just makes all the music readily available with uh, Spotify, YouTube, and all these services is just a new thing for us to develop the tools to, um, to do the research on in terms of the reception and so forth. Well, I'm so sorry that, we, that the hour is late and we called this for an hour and really didn't want to go too much longer, but I want to thank um, everyone who participated to Sharon and Laura for putting new questions to us and giving us some wonderfully reflective and thoughtful comments to Galit, to Uri, and to Jeff. Thank you so much for your response and of course to Mark Slobin as well. And on behalf of myself 
and uh, my, um, you know, uh, partner here, uh, Judah Cohen, we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And we hope that these uh, questions will just lead to more discoveries and more research. And we just look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you next time.